We have a special episode today. We're joined by Dr. Kev. Dr. Kevin Fitzgerald. We have an interview with him where he tells some stories about the past, his time bouncing for bands like the Rolling Stones, Wu-Tang, the being who? on Animal Planet. Yeah. Coming up doing comedy in the 80s. And after the interview with Dr. Kev, we do a little summary, a little breakdown on whether or not uh, he's hippie or, or not. not. Stay tuned. <laughs> I'm Zach Moss. And I'm AJ Fenny. And this is Hippie Not Hippie. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 14 of Hippie Not Hippie. Yeah. As you see, we're not in our normal studio. We're down here at Comedy Works South with a very special guest. You've seen him on Animal Planet. He was one of people's 50 most eligible bachelors. Whoop, whoop, whoop. You've heard him as the voice of the train. You've seen him doing comedy all over Denver. Dr. Kevin Fitzgerald, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks oh. for having me, boys. Yeah, welcome to the podcast, Kev. We're really happy to have you here. Oh. You're our very first guest that we've had on the show. So, Oh, nice. Well, you should have more. I mean, there's, there's much more <laughs> people than me that we know are uh, comedians. So you kind of started at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, but, but I, started, I started at the bottom, and I like it here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I feel, I feel comfortable. I started yeah. off at the bottom, and I like it here. Yeah. At the bottom of the barrel. You've led a very interesting life. You were kind of around... Uh, during the time when a lot of people would say that the hippie movement was kind of happening and going on, right? Would you- well, I became aware of it, you know, in, in high school. It, it was it, things you, you knew something was changing. It was okay. changing, you know. Women's lib had come on with a pill. Women were freed of a lot of reproductive pressures and burning their bras, and and people were being drafted. The war in Vietnam was was raging, so. There were there were definitely cultural things going on, and then in in reaction to what was happening was this counterculture movement. I think you know people that were living outside the traditional, you know people letting their hair grow or drugs had come on more common usage and and psychedelics. Uh, so you know it, it was the different the music had changed from top forty radio to FM and in great bands, man. Yeah, yeah, I look at the spoiled little hipsters now, yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I sneer at your music. Your favorite band sucks. So, so I, I think, you know, um, I, my music, you know, no, no, everybody's generation, their music is the best in them. So I say that facetiously because music saves us and, and you know, it frees us. But honest to God, the music was great. So I, I didn't... Uh, I, I couldn't play an instrument, but I, I got to. I wanted to be close to the music, so I, I started working at the door at this place in in Boulder, at the sink, and then went to Tulagi's and Chuck Morris, and he took me down to Ebbets Field. He partnered up with Barry Fay, and I started doing tours, you know, working security, concert security, and, and working with different bands. And, what? So, and so, it, so it was it was a it was a different day, you know. It, you had the feeling like anything could happen. What is a hippie? Well. I think a hippie is a person that doesn't always accept the traditional norms, and but still has a, a moral fiber. The real hippies were were dedicated people that were volunteers and would do things. You know, they were ready. They had a social consciousness, I should say. So there was a social consciousness, but it was also a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, people say, you know, you weren't there if you can't remember. You know, if you can remember it, it was a great time. And but you knew something was changing. You knew something was changing. Politics was changing. People didn't just accept, you know, routinely what, you know, the elders said. And there was this big generation of of young people. The baby boomers were a huge generation of people that come back from the war, you know, World War II. And I was born in 51, you know, and uh, yeah, I would have been born in 52, but I was sick of you. (laughs) So what what year? I'm I'm 71. What year did you uh, start bouncing at the place up in Boulder? Uh, 69. In 69. Yeah, yeah. So That's the summer. The, the summer of 69. So the summer of 69, Woodstock happened. You know, they started to open Red Rocks for shows, and man, it was, it was great FM radio, and, and, and food was different, and, and you could, 
you could do different things. You know, I think people now think that they're the radical. You know, if they don't wear a belt, you know, but <laughs> but but that was a real commitment. If you had long hair, the the, the cops would would they would mess with you. And uh, I remember. I, really, Kev. I, I went, <laughs> I, 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 I went to, Some things never change. I, I went to. Well, it was. I mean, you could. Yeah, it was. It was different, and and. Um, you know, people, you know, are you a boy or are you a girl, that type of thing. And, and you know, I, I remember I, I came home with sideburns, you know, in high school. And my father was like, no son of mine's going to look like that. You know, <laughs> look like a truck driver. What do you, you, you know, you're, you know, and, and so. But, and your father was from Ireland, right? Well, my, my parents were Irish, you know, and, but they were conservative people, you know. They didn't understand what was happening, uh, sit-ins and draft uh, burnings. and you know, But people you knew were getting killed from, from the war, you know. And, and you had people, even in the government, saying this is an unwinnable war. And, and it was divided. It wasn't as divided as now. And it wasn't the hatred that we have now. These are really different days. We could use a few hippies now and, and people with social consciousness. But, but, you know, when did you become a bad American if you disagreed with me, you know? Yeah. So, right. So you know, I, I think I, I think it, I, I, we need to listen to people's different voices. You know, and we're, we're the best when we listen to everybody and yeah. bring everybody in the tent. You know. Now, Kevin, you said that the food was different. What What did you mean by that? There wasn't fast food. You know, there was McDonald's, kinda. You know, but it just opened up to this fast food and a, a real health challenge you know to people that could you know just you know munch on on sandwiches i mean in those days you had, you had to cook your mother cooked you, you know and you sat down at dinner together you know it wasn't people standing up and you know and now you know and everything i have put goes into a microwave i'm a bachelor i mean i you know i, I don't eat very well but an el- you know. one of people's 50 most eligible bachelors well, apparently yeah. <laughs> well, well, that, that was, i think that, he, was, that was that was a, that, I, that was an odd deal you know i, I think what what year was that? Uh, Two thousand three. Two thousand three. Yeah. Nice. Did did you get a did your phone uh, blow up after that? No, man. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've been overexposed for a long time. <laughs> no That's pretty who, good coming from the bottom. Nobody's nobody's heard who I am. They haven't heard of me by now. That you know they've been, they've had their head in the sand. But it, it was a different day. The, the music was so great. I mean, you really knew something was happening, and and the. The record companies and the promoters realized that a generation had money to pay for albums, and then the the bands toured behind an album to pr- promote the album. You know, it's different now. You know, I don't know how they do it, selling it by the song. You know, they really can't do it, so they have to sell their albums and and promote that. But man, there were giant tours. You know, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Yeah. You know, and, and things like that, where they put on six bands, and they'd, they'd put on sometimes bands that didn't make any sense. You know, like. Uh, you know, Great Southern with Dickie Betts and, and Marshall Tucker, the Outlaws, and, and Molly Hatchet and Hart. You know, <laughs> it, it didn't fit, but they were just trying to get all different now, groups in. You know. When you said there were six bands, how long would those shows go? Is it like a whole Sunday? Yeah, they'd start at noon. A whole then, acid trip. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, and you bounce for one of those, man, when the people, 50 or 60 or 70 arrests with people, you know, that, you know, had a bad trip or whatever, you know, but, but we learned how to do it. And then there were a decibel people that there was a sound ordinance probably, in, you know, at the different places and, you know, for the neighborhoods. And so usually they'd stand, stop at 10 o'clock. Some would go to noon, but sometimes you'd do them in different countries. Like I did the, uh, oh, the Sun Splash and the Jamaica World Music Festival. They would, you know, play for three days, you know, I'd play all night, play, you know. And you you were bouncing this the whole three days. Yeah, you know, and, and you know you would catch them sleep and, and do shifts and and uh, you know I, I got to see the country bouncing with bands. You know, to be a little boy from Denver and and you know go with the Rolling Stones was like running away with a circus. You know, yeah, when you be a little boy or, no. or, or to see to see some of the, the the different bands. You know, and the different bouncers were famous people. You know, Tony Funches that was my boss. He looked like. One of the Broncos' big brother. I mean, he was, he was just this guy, and he had this voice that was deeper than. I mean, he was down below the cellar. You, know, you couldn't <laughs> believe his voice, and uh, he would lick people's face at the concert. You know? and, and you know, if a kid was drop, dropping firecrackers or throwing bottles or whatever he was doing, he would go up and lick their face. And if I have to come and talk to you again, 
Next time I'll bite your face like an apple. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was working. I was working at the Comedy Works. Tony died <laughs> two years ago, and, and uh, God bl God bless him. And and uh, and he was the nicest guy. And he he hired me on through different bands, and he, he was sweet. And and so at, at the Comedy Works downtown, oh, right before he died, he moved back to Denver. And I heard this voice, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought, man, it sounds like Tony, but it couldn't be. He's in California. And then the, the doorman came at the end of the show, and he said, Dr. Fitzgerald, there's, there's a giant black guy in the back, and, and he, <laughs> he won't pay his beer bill. And he said, you would pay it. And I, when I told him he had to pay his bill, he licked your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He told me to bite my face like an apple. So I went and paid his bill. But, but, you know, that, was, that was Tony, you know, and... And, and they, they were great, you know. I mean, he taught me how to uh, travel and how to. You couldn't spend any money on the tours because you had a per diem, you know, and you didn't depend on the band. It was better and better, you know. Uh, I went with the Flying Burrito Brothers, and we didn't. I didn't know how do you eat, and, and you know, and, burritos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Chris Chris Hillman, he, he, the bass player, he just was like, "Well, you just do room service." So the bills still must be coming in for that. Because you know, Chuck Grant, my partner, the, the other bouncer, he, he was like, oh, hey, let's look at the room service thing. You know what I see here? Surf and turf, that looks pretty good. You know, I have a pie. Do you mind if you send up the whole pie? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it, so it, it, wasn't, it was fly by the seat of the pants. The promoters didn't know. What would happen when you get 75,000 kids in a football stadium, you know? Um, how many sandalists do you, you need? Because they wouldn't let you use the toilets because the kids would trash them. So, so they had a football game maybe the next you know week. And so I remember Barry Faye walking through Mile High Stadium going, how, how many times does a kid pee in during an eight-hour show? You know, you're, you're trying to figure out, you know. <laughs> the different bands were different. You know, you wanted a good band. You know, you, you didn't want a dork band. You didn't want to do, you know... Barry Manilow, or you didn't want to. No, no offense, I'm good. Music. And, and, <laughs> Did you ever and, have to do Barry listening. Manilow? No, but I got I got this one where I, I can't remember if it was the Who or Who we bouncing for, and it stopped. And I had five weeks before I had to go back to school, so I called up I called up the Bill Graham people. I, I said, "Who do Who do you have? Who do you have? What do you got for you know five weeks? Well, I got I got five weeks. I two guys and three shows a week. Yeah, yeah, we could use it. Yeah, what is it? Well, it's Billy Graham. <laughs> Billy, Billy Graham, the evangelist? He needs a bouncer? Uh, we did the show, and, and I, was, I was working with, with Chuck Grant. And, and, uh, yeah, Billy Graham's fans, crazy, die hard. Well, well, we'd go, and so we each took a side of the stage. And, and uh, that's the thing about Chris Rock slapping or being slapped. Where were the people? And, you know, when I worked at security, even at a thing like that, Nobody would have got on the stage, man. If you if somebody got on the stage when you were working, you didn't get paid. When we worked for uh, Diana Ross, man, if anybody touched her, I mean, touched her outfit or touched her hair, you didn't, I mean, I just remember looking over, you know, and we were working for her. And my brother was just like slapping hands, you know, <laughs> people you know, just. And, and so anyway, so we were working Billy Graham, and all of a sudden this kid was on the aisle guy, and he was he was like all of a sudden rolling his eyes and. Talking in tongues and shaking, and he stood up and he ran toward the stage. And, and Chuck, we used to wear a piece of lead in our sleeve, you know, and and, and uh, <laughs> the bones in your arm are too big to punch somebody, you know, repeatedly at a show, and you break the bones in your hand. So you just get a piece of lead. You can't hit him in the head. You get him in the throat and hurt their breathing, and you know. So <laughs> then, then, then um, um, so. The, the guy charges the stage and screaming. <laughs> and, and so, so this Chuck, is basically church, and, yeah, and you're about Chuck, to take Chuck, the guy down. Chuck clotheslined him. You know? okay. So the guy, the guy lands flat on his back. He goes from full speed to like totally, you know, just even with the ground. And I go, no, baby, no. They want him up there. They want him up there on stage. And, and, he, and he goes, he goes, he goes, no. Look at this guy's eyes. Look at his eyes. You know, and he's, he's on. So I go, he's on the real thing, man. He's on Jesus and his shoe shine, man. He's he's mainlining the, the, you know, the the, the, the Nazarene. You know? Well, yeah, you had mentioned the bad bad trips earlier. You said like that you, you had to learn how to deal with that. Well, you did, because the police had to learn, too. And you got close to the police, and the police in diff different cities were, were good or bad. And the Denver cops, because we started early here, we trained the crowds, honest to God. They knew what they could bring in and out. They knew they had to line up. They knew they couldn't push. They knew we would 
weed out the knuckleheads that were too drunk before we even let them in. You know, if you, you see a guy that's already puking, hey, man, don't, you're not coming. Go home. You come back to a show next year when they come. <laughs> you aren't going in there. <laughs> but you go to these different cities, and you see these people in the line, and you go to the cop and go, hey, man, that guy right there. No, you know, we, we kind of, let's talk him down. So the difference between, the Boulder cops are good now, but they in the beginning, you know, but nobody knew. So I remember, I, I, you know, I, I was working a, a show, a Leon Russell show in Boulder at the Folsom Field and the Birds and who else, uh, uh, Sons of Champlain. It was, it was a great show. And, and so there was this nude guy, like acid dancing. You know, this, <laughs> this, this ball bag is hanging out. You know? out of nowhere. <laughs> and, you know, nude yeah. guy acid dancing. You know, and, he, and he's like, he's like, <laughs> and, and, you know, he's, he's just, you know, free, free swinging, you know. And, he, and and uh, you know he's he's just you know free cocking it and so and, and, and it's just like so it's a I, cock of the walk baby. So I tell the cop I say, are you gonna get that guy? And he, and, well, you know he's on something. We'll kind of get him. Let's take him and talk him. Take him to the first aid tent. And we'll talk him down. You know. So we take him to the first aid tent. And I go, you know, this guy, he, he's he's kind of mouthy and he's he's belligerent. But he's crazy acting. And I go, yeah, he needs to sleep it off in the jail. And then they, you know, put an IV in him to wake him up. And he broke the IV bottle and slashed the nurse. Oh, and man. The, and the cop looked at me and said, how, how did you know that would happen? I said, well, I've done a couple of these, you know. And when you see the naked ball bag, they go to, <laughs> go to, go to jail, you know. I just, you know. <laughs> if you see a ball bag, you know it's going to be bad. Yeah. And, and my father always said, you know, it's not a ball bag. It's a ball sack. <laughs> so I, I stand correct. Well, yeah, I, I like the, the idea of you being like, yeah, you don't. You don't take him in a tent and hook him up to an IV. What you do is is you lick his face. Right. <laughs> well, no, no. Yeah. Definitely don't lick the ball bag. If, if I could, if I could talk to somebody, ninety nine out of a hundred times, I could talk him. Hey, man, what are you doing? You know, you're gonna have breakfast on the county. You, what are you doing? Sit down, have a nice time. They're gonna throw you out of here. I could take you. Of course you could. But I'm gonna go get three other guys, and you know we're gonna get a cop. And, you know, or else you trick them, you know. So we didn't like it. You know, now I, I'm so glad I'm not doing shows now because, you know, it, there's open carry and there's uh, concealed carry. And, and so who, who knows? In those times, in those days, they said 5%, the police that used to train us and, and would go to these seminars about crowd control, they say 5% of people had guns. What is it now, man? I mean, God knows. I, I, I shudder to think so. It was working at John Denver show and, and uh, you know, there was a guy in the front row, and he was taking pictures, and you could see the gun in his belt, you know, the butt, <laughs> butt of the gun. So, you know, you don't want to go in the front of the crowd and, and just grab this guy, and, you know, what is he going to do? So I went up and I said, hey, you know, you're the guy. You're the four, you're the 4,000th person at these shows, and you get to meet John Denver. Come on with me. Come on, with right now. <laughs> yeah. so, so he walks out, and we, we go around the corner, and then there's five guys and a cop, and they get him in an arm bar and go, what the hell do you have a gun for? You know, and throw him out. So if you used your head, you know, but you couldn't go in the crowd. That's how uh, peer security came about. If you send a cop into the crowd, no matter what the kid did, the, the, everybody's on the side of the kid. Right. You know, even, yeah. even if he was throwing bottles at, you know, at the stage or lighting firecrackers and burning people. You know, I, there were certain things that I would allow, and you know, not, not that I would allow, but that, that I w was okay with. But there were things that, that we saw. What are some of those things that you... Oh, you, you know, a, a kid is smoking a joint. You know, I mean, what am I to do? You know, I mean, I'm like, hey, you know what I mean? But but when, for guys, you know, he's a naked ball sack, you know, <laughs> out, <laughs> throwing firecrackers out, throwing a bottle. But but uh, Was firecrackers, you brought up firecrackers a bunch of times. It seems like, because I've never seen, I've oh, never seen firecrackers a at a show. Have you ever seen somebody like throw or do? Like, now at a festival, maybe uh, yeah, if someone yeah. has like some bottle rockets. Yeah, I mean, something like that. But I, mean, I, I mean, no, man. That, what, what do you, I mean, people, how would they get those into the show? Well, see, in the old days, it wasn't like it is now. They didn't have metal detectors. We didn't, did we didn't have metal detectors, and, and but there wasn't the gun thing, and and we didn't have. If you work a black show, you can't touch people. You touch what? a black you touch a black guy's wife you can it's a, you can get a knuckle sandwich you touch, okay you touch my wife you know oh now see we're just checking for bottles could you open your purse you know and and so the, the, the kids would have binoculars that were really not binoculars that had whiskey in them or whatever you know right and if a guy's just bringing in booze you know I mean um, but but you know if a, if a guy had 
glass because the kids are dancing and they're dancing barefoot. And if there's broken glass, then you end up with cut feet and you're, you're dealing with that all the time, you know. You know, and, and it, the floors will get messy, particularly in, inside, you know, as that song, you know, are you, are you drinking with me, Jesus? You know, I know you walk on water. Can you dance in this much beer? And, and so, you know, so, yeah. You, right. you mentioned Bill Graham. Was that the Bill Graham from San Francisco that was running like Winterland? And uh, he was well, he did national tours. Okay, because yeah. so, he was a big he was a big he, guy he, for he, the Dead for the longest time. Yeah, well, the Dead had their own guy too, you know. So so um, it, 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 their own manager that did, did him, and, and uh, you know was, some of the bands were were great. The San Francisco bands, the Dead and, and uh, Jefferson Airplane, man, oh man, Gracie yeah. Slick, and she was. She was so intimidating and so pretty and so, so nice, you know. And, and so, yeah, I had to take her to a early morning radio where they were gonna used to talk about the concert coming up. And and you know, she's the acid queen and she's intimidating, you know. And yeah. she's gorgeous, you know. And you're just a kid, you're a thumper, you're not any, <laughs> anything important. And the band was great. The original lineup for Jefferson Airplane was oh man. And and so uh, the the DJ was asking her, you know, like, well, gosh, you know, you're the acid queen, you know. What do you listen to? What, what's your favorite song, Gracie? And she said, you know, I really like that song written by that little dork, John Duchendorf, which is John Denver. <laughs> she, she goes, that, that, uh, leaving on a jet plane. She goes, you know, and Peter Paul, man, that's really a, such a sweet song. Everybody knows somebody leaving. A, I thought, man, here's the acid queen. She's listening. Yeah. You know I mean, so be she's a person. So you, you realize, working on those tours, that people are people. I mean, it's like being a comic. Right. You know, you, you see somebody on TV and you, wow, they're a big star and they come to Denver and you meet them in the green room and, you know, you're maybe starstruck, you know, and, 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 uh, but then you realize, you know, that the, the guy says, hey, I need a sandwich, you know, and, you know, he's, you know, he's talking, he's, hey, excuse me, my wife's, my wife's calling me, you know, and, and, you know, they have children and, and problems and like anybody else, you know, but the music was, was great, but, yeah. I don't know. I mean, now how did you, if you don't mind me asking, and maybe you've answered this before on other podcasts, but how did you get tied into the whole music scene and bouncing through, through Boulder? Like, how did you get out of, like, you started, you said in Boulder. Where did you, how did you be, was, get on these the, national there, tours? There was a club in, in, in Boulder called Tulagi's, and Chuck Morris did it, and he was a, uh, the manager. And then he became a promoter, and he became a partner at the Ebbets Field here in Denver. Ebbets was another great place, man, downtown, close to the Comedy Works, off of 15th. It's a coffee shop now. And, man, it was it was great, you know. And, it was and, an outdoor venue? I've never heard no, of it. No, no, it was indoor, indoor. Okay. Eb Ebbets Field, named after his, he, he was from Brooklyn, so it's where the Brooklyn Dodgers played. You know, it was named after the ballpark. So Chuck, um, the, the Barry did national tours then. Barry Fay was a local promoter. And Barry had a vision, you know, and he was one of the first people to go to the bands and go, hey, you know, you're really missing the boat here. You're going with a different promoter in, in every city. And so you're, if, uh, there's a nut cutting every night in the accounting room about how many butts were in seats. If you let me, I'll sell every ticket for the whole United States and promote the whole thing. And that was the beginning of the modern tour. My life has been charmed, you know, I've been really lucky. You know, I, I started off just a little boy from Denver and, you know, and, and then did that and, and then, you know, went to veterinary school and the veterinary stories are, you know, are, are, are good, you know, and you can't even imagine the stuff that happens at the veterinary hospital. And, and you know, this woman came in, she had these two little Maltese and she's with her husband. They were 100 years old, you know, and she had blue hair and sweet, you know, and he's this old guy with his pants under his nipples. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so, he, you know, He's like, this is Jimmy, and this is his sister, uh, Lola. And wh what's the problem? Why is Lola here? He said, well, her tummy's getting bigger and bigger. I said, well, is she spayed? No. Is he neutered? No. Well, then I think she's pregnant. Well, Jimmy wouldn't do that. He's her brother. <laughs> she was horrified. She was horrified that Jimmy would, you know, like something like, you know, <laughs> rural Kentucky or someplace. Yeah. You know? I don't know. So uh, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but uh, you mentioned uh, like how the LSD came around in the 60s. Did you, did you ever partake in... Have, have you eaten some LSD in your You know, your I, I, was, I was really lucky. I was really lucky in seeing people that I really admired 
on those tours, get horribly addicted, and then not get asked back. Oh. Um, and and so, you know, I, 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 to me, like, some of those things, I, you know, I mean, who am I to say what somebody's uh, uh, recreational thing should be, you know, but... Yeah, I, I never was a drug guy. And, and because I wasn't a drug guy, I got asked back. Okay. You know, and, and so, but, but I was still part of the counterculture, you know. I mean, I didn't get my hair cut, you know, one time for seven years. You know, we worked for the Parliament Funkadelic and we wore uh, roach clips in our hair with yeah. the feathers, you know, it looked cool. <laughs> my, my brother had a, uh, you know, a, a wishbone in his hair, you know. And, I mean, yeah. You, you had cool things in your hair. You yeah. Know? Hair, hair is beautiful, you know. And, and so now the kids, you know, have shaved heads and, you know, I, I don't get it, you know, but, you know, black people had afros and it, hair, hair was pretty, you know, and, and uh, I, I was no prude, you know, I, I was there and, and uh, you know, <laughs> no. I, you know, if I died tomorrow, don't feel sorry for me, baby. I sow my wild oats and. And hopefully it's not done, you know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, I mean you get old, you know, and you you don't realize it. And, you know, you think back that, you know, something, you know, Woodstock was, you know, f now 54 years ago this summer, you know. I mean, yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, how could that have happened, you know. And and it was it was a different day. It was, it was uh, you really thought anything could happen. And people get hardened and, and it, it wasn't like, it, everything wasn't so commercial, you know. That, that's one thing I think that, you know, it, 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 it all can't be about the dollar. You know, sometimes I think you just have to do things well, that you go with. To me, I almost kind of felt like uh, just looking as an observer, looking back in history, that uh, the, the rebellion at the end of the 60s came because of the commercialism of the 50s, that, you know, everything was so perfect. You needed these products, this house, this car, well, that's your what family they think. That, and that, all of that. And that kind but, of... But that's not really true. <clears throat> was it not? No, like no, house it, it picket fence? It wasn't, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect, you know. And the, people now go, look back and go, oh, that was a perfect time because, you know, there weren't protesters or there weren't homeless or there won't, weren't, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the problems we have now are, are huge, you know, and... and and it's because there's too many of us. Right. And, and that's the third part of my life is the conservation trips, you know, at the North and South Pole and seeing the endangered species. And, you know, there's just, we have somehow have to get a, we're not, we're not going to have to be able to live like, like we do. You know, not everybody can have an SUV and, and, you know, and now India's coming on with the middle class and China, you know, and, and, you know, and they see American television. I worked in Mongolia, you know, for the zoo the Denver Zoo, and the kids all have a cell phone, and they, you know, the kid asked me, he said, are you in a gang? Because all he sees is American television. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I'm not in a gang. Kid. No, he asked yeah, you yeah, because, yeah. he asked you because you bounced for Wu-Tang. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, bounced, Didn't, I, I bounced for the Wu-Tang in uh, 2002, maybe, 2002 or 2003. A, a guy that I bounced for was, uh, was, promote, was the tour director needed a crew, and so he had fired us in 1976 from Earth, Wind, and Fire because he said we were too violent. And, and uh, you know, and so I, he called me up and he goes, Kev, I need you and, you know, and a couple of your cousins. And, you know, and, and so I go, you got a bloodbath. What do you got? <laughs> you, know, you, you, you want us to come. But, but it, it really evolved. It, it, it changed from, you know, bloody mouths to no bloody mouths, you know, yeah. using your head. And, and seeing what could happen before it happened, like taking the drunk guys out of the line before they came in, you yeah. Know? And and you know, and and realizing that that you know it's not about bloody mouths, and and you know having you know uh, people talk about defunding the police, but holy cow, can you imagine a Bronco game with no policemen there? I mean, yeah. it, it would be like Gotham City. Well, yeah. you know, like the <laughs> so you you moved into a realm of like being preventative. You're like, instead of just dealing with the situation when it happens, yeah, we can just avoid the, the whole situation. Yeah. We're going to put a snow fence up. In, <clears> I was, in, you know, and, but, but we came, I came from a time where the kids now I think they're hipper, you know, and I thought I was hipper than my mother and my grandmother, you know, and my grandmother is saying, you know, well, when the flappers in the twenties, we didn't wear underwear, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, nothing's new. And we used to smoke a hemp 
with the black jazz musician down <laughs> at the Chilpota Pick, you know? So, so you, you think, you know, you think you're hipper, but nobody's hip, and nobody's hip forever, you know? Yeah. And, and so I never was hip, you know? Yeah. And, and so if you think you're hip, you're not, and if you don't, you are. That, that's Keith Richards. Yeah. <laughs> Keith, Keith always say, he, he said, nobody's hip forever, and, and, and uh, if you think you're hip, you're not, and if you don't, you are. So, uh, and yeah, I'm definitely not hip. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll do shows with uh, younger comics sometimes that are newer, and it'll be for a crowd of people in their like, you know, sixties or whatever, and they'll be like, "Oh, this crowd's old," and I'll be like, "They were alive in the sixties. Yeah, they, they fucking, get it. Like they, they're fine. I talked right? to they can handle whatever the fuck you're yeah. gonna say. You know, they'll they'll be okay. It's not, but in their head, they think you know, oh, these people are." You know, the older generation or whatever. Yeah, but, but it's but. almost flip flopped because, like, last night I was in Boulder and I had done some psychedelic talk. <clears throat> and afterwards, this woman came up to me, told me about the conference coming to Denver. And then uh, I was like, Yeah, sometimes, you know, older people, I'm not sure. And she goes, I think the older people will get it more than younger people because they're, they're almost triggered by these words. Well, I. what I've heard too is the younger generation really isn't doing as much drugs and stuff or having sex. And I'm like, fuck. You're not having out. sex. <laughs> what the hell? What a, a celibate city. Yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? I, right. I mean, oh, man, it was a, it, I mean, it wasn't free love, but it was, you know, you'd be on those concerts and people were like, you're kind of cute. You know, I, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like free love, but it was different. You know, women had, you know, taken on a different thing. The, the um, birth control had, and freed him up a, a lot. I think you can be a, a moral person without being a religious person, you know? Yeah, and, and, for sure. And so... Yeah, I don't think they're mutually you, yeah, exclusive. And, and, and so I think you can have values and, and you know, and, and, and be okay. And, and I think for real hippies, you know, it, it, you know, there was, there was a, a system. They had their own system, you know? I, I, I worked for The Who and, and Meher Baba was this guy that didn't talk for all these years and... and uh, he wrote notes, and you know, he'd, like, he'd write, nothing is everything. You know, I always remember that, you know, that n nothing's everything, you know, and, and that, uh, or let's see action. And yeah, man, let's see some action. You know? and so, <laughs> that seems you know, like a Dr. Kev quote, yeah, let's yeah, see some action. Yeah, you know? So, I mean, anybody tells you that they're bored, um, it's so sad to me because nobody should be bored there's literature and music you know there's food and travel there's photography there's movies there's you know there's sex i mean god i mean well yeah we had to buy every album when we were young i think about that all the time where like half of my childhood was spent like looking at a catalog full of albums thinking like which ones i'm gonna buy when i get the money so that well, i can was, listen it to most, them it was or, most fun you'd go down to the record store and you'd yeah. wait and you they would have on the wall when the Things was gonna when they when they were gonna be released, but the albums had pictures of your heroes, and you tried to get your hair to look like theirs, or you know, get a jacket with a collar that stood up like that. And I remember seeing Jeff Beck and going, "Oh man, that guy! Look at yeah. that guy's hair! <laughs> you know, I could do that. You know, or or, or you know, um, and, and so in the 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 liner notes, you know, they they were you know careful, and the albums were put together carefully, you know, the song progression, you know, and. So I, yeah, I, I feel sorry for the bands now not having that. Do you do you still own a turntable? No, I have I have a million CDs, but my my nieces call my house Old Town. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just listen to you know stuff that. But you listen to your generation, and that's right. You know? Yeah, I remember my father walking around the house, you know, on Sunday morning. My mother would make him dust and help her clean, and he'd be snapping his fingers, you know, and and uh, he would be listening to Frank Sinatra. Yeah, with Nelson Riddle in the orchestra and going, now this, Kev, this really swings. And my brother would be making the square sign. Behind <laughs> you, you know, saying, you know, this, this doesn't swing, you know. <laughs> this doesn't swing at all. But, it, but if you listen to it now, it really does. And so I think it's, it's not fair to judge the culture of another generation and what they did. And that's why I think it's really unfair to hold comics to task for jokes they said 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean... the. Uh, it was you can you can go back and watch a television show from 2011 and be like half of these jokes don't really fly anymore. You, you couldn't know? do that joke. You, you couldn't. You know they couldn't make a a, a thing like uh, Blazing Saddles anymore. You know, but when? Yeah, I actually went to uh, 
a, a thing with Mel Brooks where they showed Blazing Saddles. And uh, it was like three years ago here in Denver. They showed Blazing Saddles, and then he went and did a talk afterwards. And he, he walked out, and he goes, uh, just uh, the question we get the most, I'm going to answer it right out the gate. No, we couldn't make Blazing Saddles today, <laughs> obviously. And what made me laugh so hard about it was that watching the movie in there with a bunch of young people that had never seen it. Watching were, them get paralyzed. They were audibly gasping. <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh. yeah. You know, and there's, you know, still some laughter, but it, it took a while, I think, for the audience to be like, okay, we can, this is okay. Right. You know, to, to watch this. But uh, yeah, there was audible gasps in well, the room. I, I've, I've thought that all the time. I've wondered about that all the time. Is there a line? You know, is there a line with your jokes? And and so, or should there be censorship, you know, in, from the government on a movie or, or whatever? I mean, when you, in my lifetime, it's come full circle. They couldn't swear on TV. There were only yeah. three channels when I was a kid, you know? There were only, you know, there, were, there, were, there wasn't cable. And so we're now on cable, you know, the, the other day, you know, that, that some woman's like, you motherfucker. You know, you're like, well, a woman just said motherfucker, you know? And, and, and so... And remember, Gone with the Wind, it was a big deal that, you know, Clark Gable said, frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. And that was the first time anybody sweared, and they were going to censor the whole movie. And and so, you know, but it's, it's come. So should there be censorship, you know, or, or is there a line? I think, watch the audience. Is, is there something that's hurtful or mean-spirited? Yeah. I think jokes are totally okay unless they're so mean-spirited and so ugly. You know, if you're talking about, you know, there's some things... There's for me. There's there's a there's some holy cows that aren't shouldn't be holy right. cows, you know. And and uh, and so there are some things that that uh, that really are holy cows, you know. What I mean, you, you know. What I mean, but I think it comes down to intent, right? Like if your right. intention is to make people laugh, usually you can see that. Like you can yeah. see that, like but, someone's but trying see, to bring but joy. People are morons, and they're trying to make people laugh. And like you know, some one of the, one of the young people, I say kids, you know. But I shouldn't, the young comics, um, you know, but, you know, the kids said, I got the best Holocaust joke in the world. I just go, oh, man, I mean, where, where can you do that, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? I, well, and I think that's... How come Hitler didn't drink tequila? You know, it, it made him mean, you know? I mean, that, that's, that's, you know that's, you, but Hitler jokes, you can't even do that, you know? <laughs> the, you, people, you did a Hitler joke, and you said, well, it's, you know, it's not like, you know, he's, he's a great guy. Well, and that's... I don't know. That's what I think is kind of interesting about all these people being like, oh, they're coming for comedy and all this. And it's like, well, I don't think they really are. I think they're coming you, for bad comedy. Yeah. It's like you, you get arrested and it's not like you're actually canceled either. Louis C.K. sold out Madison Square Garden a few weeks ago. Roseanne is saying she's canceled by, on her national special or whatever. It's like right. you're not canceled. Mel, Mel, you Gib Mel Gibson's back in movies. Is yeah. he? Fat yeah. Man. Yeah. Wow. So, Yeah. So I have a I have an interesting question. You were born um, September, right? September twenty yeah, third, which makes you a Pisces. No, no, a Libra. First day of Libra. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting. Do you feel like you have those characteristics of a Libra? Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I Libras are the scales, right? Yeah, balancing scales. And, and so you're supposed to be well balanced. And so I don't know. A lot of my friends are. You know, people would say, you know, I don't know if that's the right thing for him. You know, <laughs> he's so unbalanced. You know, I mean, I, I, I've learned so much. You know, I learned, you know, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm I'm Irish, so we have a tendency to be a snapper, you know. Yeah. And and you can't be that, you know, with, with uh, road rage and, and things, you know. I, I, I just think, you know. But it does make me really mad. When people have their cell phone going, you want to see a picture of this thing I did this weekend? And they can't find the goddamn <laughs> picture. And they're looking through. Oh, that's my vacation. Oh, that, that's my grandmother's birthday party. Oh, no, that's my Whoa, kid. there's that's my, my dick. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, and so, there's my ball bag. And, so, and so, so when people do that to me, I just go, you know, you deserve a punch in the mouth. <laughs> doing this to me. Make me do, or, yeah. the, or the people, the goddamn pedestrians that stay in the crosswalk and look at you. Yeah. And, and the, the light's going to change, and you're halfway. You go, can you walk slower there? granddad you know can i get you a cane are you gonna are you gonna camp there are you like a a settler you yeah know, you're gonna you're, you know pro, you know oh man they're like but, 
so as a Libra with those balancing scales, one thing I think about with you is like, how does someone go from kind of being like a, a, a bruiser to loving animals and being such a, like a, a such a passionate vet? Animals aren't people. AJ. <laughs> <laughs> people are animals. People are animals. Right, right. But animals are not people. Yeah. Did you have a love for animals the whole time? Yeah, you know, I got a book coming. Okay. And and uh, it starts off, you know, uh, uh, all nice stories. And, and y- you know, even though we were bouncers in the very beginning when the, it was so different, you know, we hit anything that moved, you know, and we got some bad karma coming probably. But, oh, I don't know, man. I, it I, better I, hurry up. I, 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 yeah, I'm not going to be here forever. Elude that karma. Yeah, yeah but, I mean, I, I think... The, the best line is in, in The Unforgiving, the Clint Eastwood movie, the kid says, he, he had it coming, didn't he? And he goes, kid, we all got it coming. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so we all do. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, it doesn't cost anything to be kind. You know? Right. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, as old as I am, love and kindness save the day, you know. And, and I mean, so, and, and, but it sure was fun traveling, but it wasn't about thumping heads you know it was about keeping people safe you know and, and we, we were proud when we put you know on the end of a tour you know three or four million people 77 shows in and nobody died you know right and people could stand up and yell fire or do things and and you, you had to you know, think fast or you had to but if you saw what could happen and thought of it before and, and that's why i think it that held me in good stead one thing from the bouncing that really helped me were people skills and dealing with people and, and that, you know, being a veterinarian when people are upset or whatever, you know, they're, they're mad or their dog is sick and they, they, they don't understand. Or, you got to go, I'm, I'm going to take you out back. No, and, no, you, you go, look, I, I understand. If, if you could listen, if I could listen to the mean people, I mean, certainly people needed to get thumped. But, but you, it, you know, if you could listen to them 99 out of 100 times, you, you could figure it out, you know. You, you know, they're just, you know. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I could take you. Yeah, well, sit down, man. You don't want to, you know. But usually their their anger is coming from a different place. They're not mad at you. They're usually mad at something else, right? They, they came in mad or they came in drunk, you know. Right. Drunk. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was, uh, I don't think we've ever talked about this. I was a bouncer for like over a year and I had uh, one fight in my bar that whole time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but no, I would do the same thing. My big move was, and whenever a guy was with a lady, you know, and he's too drunk, they'd be like, you got to go kick that guy out. You gotta, I would go, I would go pull him aside. I would never talk to him in front of his girlfriend or with his girlfriend or his wife or whatever. I would always pull him aside and I would say, hey, man, uh, they've told me that you, you got to go. Uh, it's not my call. It's theirs. I just am the one who's got to be the bearer of bad news. And uh, yeah, man, I drink here too on my nights off, and sometimes they throw me out of here too. But I, I just didn't want to do it in front of your girlfriend, so I wanted to give you a chance to just act like you want to leave. Oh, that's a smart so way that to you do can it. just yeah. go pay your tab and say, "Hey, babe, fuck this bar, let's get out of here." Yeah, and, and they'd be like, "Thanks, man," and then they would usually just go pay their fucking tab and leave. Yeah, because you showed them respect, which is probably something that was lacking when they got. Rail. And yeah, well, and it's real easy to spot when somebody comes into a bar. Like, there's guys that just go out for the night and they're looking for a fucking fight. And I can see it. I can see it fucking you, you the did, second you, I look at him. You did it smart because if you, you, you know, confront him in front of his girlfriend, he's going to become a lion. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you, you got to get him aside from his girl and go, now. Nah. Yeah, <laughs> that's dance. Well, because he's got to he's got to show himself. You know, he can't. He so, can't. You know, you're going to go back to your, your girlfriend with a mouthful of bloody chicken. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know and, and so but but yeah, you're right. If you get him aside from the girl, because the other part were drunk girls. And what do you do? You can't thump them, you know, and they're screaming. And, they, you know, I worked with this guy. Oh, man. Yeah, you get hit in the head with a shoe. We called him Zipperhead after that. <laughs> yeah. but, oh, I did see a woman attack another woman with a high. I had to separate some some fights with. Like I saw a woman attack another woman with a stiletto high heel, and that was fucking vicious. No man, man. I, mean, I watched my aunt go after somebody in a giant alley bra, like brawl, not bra. Uh, but she had a high heel up, and it, you could just hear pop. And I was like, "This is I'm nine years old. This is brutal." <laughs> uh, no, if you could. What I've learned is, <clears throat> if it looks wrong, it is. 
and just get out of there. You know, just walk away. Where you park your car is important. Look around under a bright light. You know, yeah. And, you know, if it looks wrong, it is. You know, if it, that's yeah, the only trust thing. your gut. That's what I tell people. You know, young people, I would say, you know, look, you know, just use your head. You know, it, it's in in yeah. I, these are different days. You know, and, and you know, people. Yeah, I wonder. You know, when I, I look at Ireland or I see Mongolia, or I see these places. You know, we're a violent country. You know, yeah. in, in some of these places, it, in Canada, you know, going up for the polar bears and stuff, you know, people are like, they're so polite, you know? And yeah. It's, it's like, you know, could I help you, eh? Yeah. <laughs> you know? well, and I'm sure when you go to do a lot of your travels, like when you're going to Mongolia or whatever, I'm sure you have a lot of your friends, family and stuff that are like, oh, be careful over there. You know, I've read that, you know, like whenever you're traveling to these places, you probably have these people that are worried because everyone in America thinks <laughs> if you leave this country, it's so dangerous. And right. it's like, to be honest, we're one of the most dangerous countries to visit yeah. in the, it's, in the world. Like it, we're safer like, there than you are. Yeah. Like when people, people get like when they're coming to America, they're like, Hey, if you're, if people start shooting around you, this is what you're supposed to do, you know? Cause th that's not a, that yeah. doesn't exist there. Well, yeah. and I think like we were in Jamaica and they told us how dangerous it was if you left the Jamaica resort. Jamaica's not safe. No, but I, you know what I think some of it is, is it's desperation. They see well, you it, and they think that they can get that money to survive. Wherever the English were is brutal because there's a, there's a, you know, the bullet law there where, they, you know, they go to jail if they just have a bullet. And, the, and, and, and you know, there's, there's certain places in the world where, you know. Uh, I don't know about this bullet law. It, oh, in, in Jamaica, the, you know. They, they, they were the, the the number of it was a caste system, you know, with the whites and then mixed uh, mixed blood people and and um, and then the the blacks and and so of course it, you know it's stratified and, and you're right it's a culture of despair you know and and when we did the World Music Jamaica uh, Festival in 1982 we took down. Uh, 30 American bands and put uh, 30 Jamaican bands on. And it, it was a great show. And Who were the uh, big biggest names that you remember? Oh, The Clash and The Grateful Dead. We took down, uh, oh, man. The, were these the guys that went or the guys that were turned down? The, no, the Beach Boys went, and, and so every, everybody was there. And then Tosh played and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Whalers. Um, and, and it, it was uh, after Bob Marley had died, and, and then... Uh, um, Tosh was still alive, and, and you know, Burning Spear and, and Yellow Man, you know, yeah. And, yeah, nobody move, nobody get hurt. Yeah, <laughs> and, and he's an albino, you know. Yeah, it's a that's a violent place, you know, and, and <clears throat> that, but it is beautiful, it, like the landscape. Of oh, it is, so is beautiful. beautiful, and, and uh, uh, a place in the United States that is, that is tough too is is New Orleans. You know, you get away from the French Quarter, and you know, and, and some of those places, you know, and. and uh, uh, North Ward, and you know, I mean, some of those places are tough, you know, and and and, and it's a culture of despair, you know, and the haves and have nots, and and so I, I think that you know you have to use your head where you travel. Yeah, I'm not helping much. I don't know if this is a good one. You this can, is fun. You can scrap this one and bring no. bring Novus in, and, <laughs> you know, if he's not too stoned. No, <laughs> <laughs> this is great, man. Yeah, I mean, I. Uh, I've always loved uh, hanging out and chatting with you in the green room, and uh, well, I've nice. always, yeah, always, vice, vice versa, man. Vice yeah, versa. it's always a good time, and uh, no, I'm happy to to have you on as our first guest. Yeah, so. and I would say after uh, listening to your stories, I mean, you may have been a bruiser at one point, you may have been a little rough around the edges, but I think your heart well, is full hippie. Let's let's. I've got a few questions. Okay, uh, do you do you own any Birkenstocks? No, and people that have crystals, you know. <laughs> I, was never, I was never into crystals, you know. You know, fuck crystals. You know? And, and I, I just, you know, if you, do you, you know, no, I don't have a Birkenstock. Do you, do you burn I, any sage? No. Man. Incense at all? No, fuck that. You know, the, the, <laughs> and, and patchouli oil. You know, yeah. The people came in and smelled like that, you know. I just, I, the kids still put that on. No, and, AJ and, came over the other day and I'm like, what the fuck got, is that? Yeah, it's so on. strong. Yeah, I, did, yeah. I would come to his house and he just kept going, that's so aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> it is, man. It yeah, smells it, like it, shit. No, it, that's a, yeah. So, so, I mean, there, there were things, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, 
harmonic convergence or, or whatever, you know, and, and, and there, there were certain things that you knew were bullshit right away, you know, and, you know, yeah, I put this crystal on your head, you know, and I'm, I'm Irish, so there are all these superstitions anyway yeah. that you knew were bullshit, you know, you know, and that, you know, you, you uh, have to, when, uh, when somebody dies, you have to go tell the bees, you know, or else they stop making honey. You know, <laughs> you're, you're five years old going, well, that, my grandma, that doesn't go. Yeah. <laughs> Why do I have to tell the bees, you know? So, yeah, I mean, so there were things. Being a hippie was in your heart, you yeah. know, and there was a social consciousness and willing to volunteer things. I mean, we're going to lose Jimmy Carter here in the next few days, you know, he's in hospice. But he wasn't, you know, his presidency was blighted by the, Iran hostage crisis, but yeah. but afterward, man, the guy became love personified. The stuff he did, and so we could learn a lot from that. You know, all of us could I, pick up on that. Uh, seeing that he was going into hospice care yeah. uh, yesterday really uh, made me think. My dad talks a lot about how he thinks that was where America took a really bad turn. Where if like Jimmy Carter would have had one more term, that like America would have been on a much Higher trajectory? Well, he wasn't well thought of, you know, because of Iran and because of the economy at the time. And, and Reagan was so blustery and came in. And Reagan was, you know, kind of a uh, early forerunner of what the Republicans became. And, and you know, you know, here's a person, he's an actor, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, he has no he's leadership skills. He's not been in Congress or, you know, I mean, so the cult of personality, you know, Donald Trump, I mean, you have a guy... That's a, a wealthy guy that was a you know a reality TV host or you know star and you know I mean the problem is our good people don't go into politics yeah you know, the good the people that would probably do the best job and and it, it, it happens even in grade school you can go you look at the people that ran for student council and stuff and you're like <laughs> well that guy's an asshole you know <laughs> yeah and, and you're a kid you know and you didn't run for student council uh, and yeah. you're a nicer kid than than anybody you right. Know? AJ, I would have voted for you. I've, you know? I've got that. I got the personality. I've been working on a, a bit about kind of that. Well, I made like a little song about it too, but it's basically that like the one qualification that a person should have to be president is that they can't want to be president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if you want to be president, something's fucking wrong with you. You know, yeah. the Groucho Marx. You know, uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't be in any club that would have me. Right. You know? <laughs> For sure. Where, where are we? Do we? Yeah, we're, we're yeah. about good. Uh, you said you have a book coming out. Is there anything you'd like to plug, Kev? And or uh... well, I, I'm talking to a publisher, but I, it, it, I got to talk to you know our our friends are doing books. You know, um, uh, Sam. You know, it, it had such a wonderful book, and and, and yeah. Sam Talent, and and then uh, Brent Tobler has his multiple books. So yeah. you go with the publisher, Adam Caton Holland, a wonderful, touching book, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so wonderful. And, and so do you go with the publisher or do you self publish, you know? And so I'm, I'm learning the ins and outs of that first. And, but it's ready to go and, and it's going to be nice. It's uh, my life in five parts, you know, growing up Irish, then bouncing for bands, you know, and traveling, and then veterinary stories, and then humor and different things. You know, when I started doing comedy, what year did you start doing stand up? 86. 86. I, I was a chicken act. I had a <laughs> little chicken. I was trying to teach myself the accordion. I played the accordion, and this chicken, one chicken would stomp his feet. <laughs> so I, I had stapled some tinsel onto his wing so it looked, you know, like it danced. And, and, uh, and, and I'd come out and play the accordion. That's the moment I looked I at was, Zach and he's like, like, is he serious? Is he a, fucking with no, me right now? I was, I was a chicken egg. It was, called, uh, it was called Chick Fowler and Jackie Davis. And, and, and I was Chick Fowler and the chicken was Jackie Davis. You know? And so then at the end of the act, I'd bring out, folks, I know you love us and you come all around to see us, but the real star of the show is Jackie Davis Jr. And then I'd had a little chick in my pocket and put him out and he'd run around the stage. <laughs> But it didn't work because the, the chickens would jump into people on their tables or near their drinks and salmonella and stuff. So George McKelvey was like, if a chicken got in a person's drink, could, that, could they sue me? Or, you know, and so it, and I, I let the chickens go. And last time I heard they were living in Colorado Springs. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I first started, that was just the first one. I, I used to... Uh, be a, a tank comic. I, I had a tank and I, and I got a, a bucket over my head, you know, tank of water, you know, and then 
you pulled the bucket over your head and there's air in it. And, and then we, we fixed a microphone that was waterproof. And you go down and you couldn't see the crowd, you couldn't hear the crowd. And I'd do one line. It's like, you know, what has four balls and eats ants? My two uncles in Schenectady. You know, it was just, you know, it, was just uh, it, it didn't work. The chickens didn't work. It should have. You know, and then I, I, I tried uh, the theme from uh, the first thing I ever tried was the uh, first time I went on stage was the theme from uh, the War 12 Overture. Boom. And so there's like nine or ten booms. So I had pants that were slit with a different colored cord. And every time the boom, they'd pull the pants off. And at the end, I had a jeweled jock strap. And just be standing there <laughs> naked. And I would say, I hope to make some more motion pictures, which is what Elvis would say when we worked for Elvis at the end of his show. And, but then they got mad at the comic books and said, you can't be a... Uh, on your stage, we don't have a cabaret <laughs> license in a jeweled jockstrap. The best thing I ever did, though, it should have worked. This should have worked. I, I, I do the dying comic. And, and so I got a hospital bed that was in the back of our vet hospital that somebody donated. And we rolled the bed out and I faked an oxygen tank, you know, and I'd be under the bed and have an ill fitting gal on my ass hanging out. And then a tube, you know, hanging out, you know, like with uh, you know, a bag full of IV, you know, and they just taped you. And, and then the MC would go, Folks, we don't know if this is going to work. The doctor told him it's a dying comic, and uh, they said if, if, if he if you laugh if you laugh he might get stronger. It's one chance in a million. We, we don't think it'll really work, but if you laugh, here he is one time only. The dying comic. So they roll out the bed, you know, and you're dying, and then they give you the microphone under the tent, you know, on the, it's the pla- it was just you know saran wrap, you know, and, and I just go, you know, uh, who circumcises whales? Four skin divers, you know, and then the people laugh. But then, then they're into it. You, know, you, know, yeah. you sit up in bed and you start combing your hair and, and knock the thing down. And then you jump out and run up and down the stage. Then you take a bow. And then you leave and, and your ass is hanging out, you know, when you leave the stage. But they didn't like that. You know? Classic. Mm-hmm. So you kept getting in trouble for nudity a lot yeah. in your early act. Yeah. My nudity and, and, and chickens. Yeah. So. Well, Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you, you want to go plug whatever you got going on? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, February the 24th, um, Friday, I will be in Trinidad with Nathan Lund at The Well. And I will be headlining license number one up in Boulder all weekend this weekend. So come stop in there and say hi. Great place. I'm working with Jacob Rubb. Uh, his place, that place next to Casa Bonita. You know? Oh, yeah. That's a fun, uh, that's a fun West Facts. Yeah, 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 West yeah. Facts Brewery. So uh, last night we were down at the South Club with Dr. Kev, and we kind of ran out of time because the show had to start. We had to entertain about a hundred fucking kids, dude. So many, so many kids. Yeah, man, and young ones, real young, like ones that were so young they didn't even understand fucking etiquette. Like, well, yeah, they shouldn't like understand little, fuck. Like little kids, yeah, fucking <laughs> etiquette for children. Yeah, that's uh, uh, well, they didn't understand etiquette. Right, their fucking etiquette was on point. No, uh. <laughs> I was I was in the back talking to to Brian Callen at one point, and I was like, I was like, you know, the weird thing about kids is it's different than like clean, and it's definitely different than like corporate clean. Yeah. Because I realized at one point I was like, oh, I could do this. I'm flappy <laughs> enough, and then I was like, wait a minute, kids don't understand anxiety yet. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to go, why are you so freaked out? Fuck yeah, they understand anxiety, dude. <laughs> I don't know. So every time I'm doing a kid show, the thing that I <laughs> always try to tell myself is that one of the first movies I was ever shown in my life starts out with a fucking deer's mom being murdered. Oh, Bambi. Yeah. Like, I feel like Bambi is child abuse. Like, like is that <laughs> what... <laughs> It's like what? It's a cartoon snuff film. Well, yeah, because it's, well, it's like I don't remember. So I don't remember anything about the movie Bambi other than there is a rabbit thumper. thumper. Oh yeah, did I? But that I don't was remember, my fave. I don't remember anything though about the story as an adult other than mom gets fucking capped in the beginning. That's all I fucking uh, yeah. remember. That shit fuck. That shit fucked me up, man. Uh, I, and I like what, like. I just wonder the parents back then, because parents don't still show Bambi to their fucking kids, do they? Like we I all mean, know, I don't like know. we all know, like hey, that was fucked up when we were right. kids. Like people don't do that anymore. Do it's they? hard. It's almost like you sit someone down. And you go, I'm gonna today. You're gonna get hardened up. They show you Bambi. You get your hunting license, and then you eat deer. <laughs> like is that a, 
Is that a trajectory that you no, would? And then I started it? thinking, I'm like, who the fuck made like? I guarantee there's like some secret PETA conspiracy where they're just like animal rights activists are like, all right, so we're gonna make a kids movie where the first thing we 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 humanize a deer and then we have humans murder its mother. <laughs> Did you in in front of it? Aggressive humans at that, if I remember, I have a very faint memory of those like. It's almost like Fantasia. Yeah. It's traumatic. No, I, re- I remember them sodomizing the deer. No. They killed it. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you eat venison or, or deer? Was your dad a hunter? Oh, man. Or uncle or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I, I ate venison and deer. I've never shot a deer. I've never gone deer hunting, but I grew up in South Dakota. So right. yeah, it wasn't, I, I've eaten plenty of deer, Do you, deer sausage and jerky. And did you have that weird? So we did that when I was younger and I just remember I've had the gamey meats. Yeah. It's about, it's really good stuff, but I don't think this was me. I feel like it was my brother and, uh, they did not tell my sister what we were eating. Um, and then she was like, I don't know. It tastes weird. And then my Bambi. brother was like, you're eating Bambi. And then she was just like really distraught. So, uh, Bambi tangents aside, uh, yeah. we had a great uh, chat with Dr. Kev, and uh, we didn't really get a chance to determine if Dr. Kev is hippie or not hippie. Right, that's true. I didn't even find out. I was getting ready to ask him if he ever wore or had a tie-dye, and never, never, we never got into that. No, but we... Here's what I love, though, is that at the end of the interview, when, we, when he got off mic, he stood up and he goes, that's right. I'm a fucking hippie. What? <laughs> Did that happen while I was like? I think you, you I, had to run to the dude, bathroom. Dude, I had to pee so bad. Yeah, you had to run to the bathroom. As soon as he was like, fuck crystals, I was like, I think I have crystals in my bladder right now. Yeah, no. Uh, so I I feel like he's a hippie in the way that I'm a hippie, though, and that he's a, he was a part of, of a counterculture. Yeah. But when it comes to hippie things, he doesn't have a turntable anymore. He doesn't, uh, so he doesn't listen to records. He definitely he said like, fuck crystals. He said fuck crystals. Yeah, no He's, Birkenstocks. I, said, I said, do you burn incense or shit? And he goes, fuck no. Yeah, patchouli was absolutely <laughs> no, a no. He hated that. Like, yeah, he hated patchouli. So I think he's kind of like me in the regards of. Uh, well, I I was thinking about this on the way way to the studio today. Is especially with him and with you. Yeah, I also think there's the violence. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, you know, you couldn't just punch people all yeah, night long. You couldn't just. So you had uh, to put a lead pipe in your yeah. sleeve, and I'm like, not hippie. That's you don't, don't want to. <laughs> yeah, after a whole night of yeah. the stones, you're gonna break your hand. Yeah. <laughs> so you just put a lead pipe. You know, I, the thing is, is like, uh, you know, some people. Yeah, look, some people need to be thumped. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it when he said that, but then he said several times that. Uh, he goes, I think being a hippie is inside. It's yeah. something in the heart. And that's where I was like, that's a very hippie statement. Yeah, no, he is a complicated but, man. Yeah, he could flip at one second and go, would you call me? <laughs> 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 but I really enjoyed the interview. Yeah, well, what what I thought was interesting is that even for a children's show at Comedy Works, he still... Had a lead pipe. And a sweet. <laughs> <laughs> One of these kids gets out of control. <laughs> but, That's so great. Yeah, my verdict at the end of the day is is going to be uh, not not full hippie. Not He's full. not full hippie. I I mean, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I. So here's the thing. I I'm kind of on our scale of square to crunchy. I'm going to give him. Yeah, I'm going to give him a four. Dude, that's tough. Like I, I got him in the middle. Like yeah. it's really weird because I, I have him like. There's definitely sides to him that I'm like, you're definitely hippie. Like, but then there's other sides where I'm like, no, you're definitely not this type of hippie. But I feel like at some point we're gonna have to categorize well, hippies also. I think because there's pe- like political hippies, you crunchy know, hippies, jam I hippies. I think peace and love are a quintessential part of being peace, right? Like right, the, the sign right. of the hippie is. The peace sign, right. not the lead pipe in the sleeve <laughs> with the fist. What if he had a but, – but I feel like with Dr. Kev, I feel like that lead pipe probably had a peace sign engraved well, in it. And like, I could see Dr. Kev being like, no, I am a hippie. 
I'll beat your fucking ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't you, think I'm a hippie? I'll fucking punch you. But he also had those things where he said, uh, you know, it was about preventing the violence. The violence. He also said it wasn't just violence for the sake of violence, where I feel like maybe a hell's angel was like, no, we enjoy violence. He was like, I'm doing it for the greater good. Well, he did say that out of all their tours, like nobody died on that big, you know. Yeah. And that's, you know, maybe that... Astro World or whatever yeah. in Houston where all those people died. Maybe they needed Dr. Kev up front just punching people in the face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They needed Dr. Kev with a lead pipe in his sleeve. Right. And I like how he goes, well, you couldn't hit him in the face. You know, you just hit him in the throat. Right. right. <laughs> Knock the wind out of him. Yeah. <laughs> God. Uh, but, uh, God. well. We forgot to get a picture with him last night. But yeah, I know. Final. You know, I yeah. literally thought about it the second you walked out the door, but yeah, final, you had to have your meeting. Final verdict on Doctor Kev: three, two, one. Not hippie. hippie. Oh shit! All right. Well, I think we're gonna have to have Doctor Kev on again. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to get him back on. I think this time when he comes on, I want him to bring his. I want to lead see pipe? how to keep a lead pipe in my sleeve, you know, for the apocalypse. So, oh, dude, that would be a good one. We should, we should get a video of him teaching us how to. Yeah, fight that would zombies. be a, that would be a great uh, TikTok. Is Doctor yeah. Kev shows you how to punch people in the throat '70s <laughs> style with a lead pipe in your sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> So, I hope you guessed my name. Now, uh, always a pleasure uh, talking with Dr. Kev, one of my yeah. favorite uh, people here in Colorado. Yeah, so. dude. He, you know, when I met him after moving out here, I was like, this is this is one of the reasons I came out here. Like, these guys. Oh, yeah. No, he fucking rules, man. All I, those uh, people last night at the show were great. Like, one of my favorites, John. Oh, yeah. John Novosad. Novosad came in. Uh, Dr. Kevin Fitzgerald and Brian Callen. I bet between the three of them, there's a hundred years of comedy yeah, experience. Yeah, and all in different realms. Oh, yeah. But my no, favorite. Like I went out there and told those kids up front. I was like, hey, kids, because a lot of them is their first show. I'm schooled. like, you're about to get, you're about to get spanked. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I love it. John came in one, at one point. He was just cracking jokes the whole time. But my favorite was when he came in. He's like, guys, uh, I don't want to warn anybody, but uh, these kids are fucking hammered. <laughs> And then Brian and I were laughing. I was like, could you imagine one kid be like, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to go to school tomorrow because there's no way I can put block on block. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and then it's like a wild card. He shot it off and I was like, yeah. Well, that was episode uh, 14 of Hippie Not Hippie. We'd love to hear what you thought about yeah. our first guest. And yeah. Uh, if you have any questions yeah. uh, for him in the future, let us know because we're definitely going to have him back on. And uh more guests to come. Yeah. So like, subscribe, and we'll see you next week. We love you. Love you guys. And Get girls. on the motherfucking bus. bus. Hey, is it okay if I drive the bus? <laughs> hey, man, I'm on reds. I'm on reds. <laughs> Your head did blow